Welcome to our series, uh, Within a Series. And I say that because this is still part of the larger Roman series that we are going through this year. It's just that today and next week, we are focusing on world missions as our way of continually reminding ourselves of the biblical call to all Christians and to our movement in particular to take the gospel to the nations. We're calling this series, The Mission Continues, because we're not the first generation of Christians to face such an incredible uh, crisis or pandemic or trial, and we're not the last. And so crises, they're not a sign to stop. It's more a reminder to persevere. Now, there's several reasons why Paul wrote Romans, and one of the primary reasons was Paul intended actually to move to Rome and turn it to his apostolic base to reach all of the western half of the Roman Empire. See, by this point when he wrote Romans, he had already reached the entire eastern half of the Roman Empire by preaching the gospel, planting churches out of Antioch. And so now, he's looking out his window to the west, and he can picture all the unreached cultures and peoples and nations, and he planned to move to Rome from which he could reach the entire western half of the empire. And it was a great plan. I mean, Rome was the world capital. It was the political, business, cultural capital of the entire world. It was ethnically diverse. Um, in our terms today, you'll find Arabs. It was populated by Arabs, Europeans, Asians, Africans. So you could literally reach the world from Rome. And maybe most importantly, Christianity was exploding in first century Rome, um, quite possibly literally in the tens of thousands. And so it's the first picture we have of how the Christian faith intersected with a big uh, mega city. And so you had uh, a thriving church, a thriving faith in an international mega city. And so Paul was excited. It was a fantastic plan. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 10. Um, I'll read from verse 12 to 15, and then we will jump to verse 17. Verse 12. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So it was a great plan. It's all working, the stage was set, but there was one big problem. Again, there were thousands of believers in Rome, possibly hundreds of house churches, but then you had Christian Jewish churches and you had Christian Gentile churches, but very few churches or quite possibly none where Jews and Gentiles worship God together. So they were divided along racial lines. And today, and there's a lot of good ideas on how to bridge races or bring about racial reconciliation, like open dialogue, or maybe new policies are needed. And that's all good. But Paul had one simple answer. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the word of Christ. In fact, in Romans 1.16, we're all familiar with this. When Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, it's the power of God to save the Jew and the Greeks or basically the Gentiles. And when he said that, Paul wasn't being naive. He wasn't being hyper-spiritual. See, by the time Paul wrote Romans, we know from the book of Acts that he had led a proconsul in Paphos to Christ. He had the whole city of Pisidian Antioch gathered, we know this in Acts 13, to hear the gospel, an entire city. And in fact, not just the city, but the Bible says in verse 49, Acts 13, it spread throughout the region beyond the city, it spread throughout the region. And then Paul was stoned in Lystra and literally left for dead outside of the city. He even convinced the apostles in Jerusalem that God had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles through the gospel. In Acts um, 16, 
Paul was taking the gospel all the way to Asia when he literally was stopped by the Holy Spirit and rerouted to the West to take the gospel instead uh, towards Europe. In Philippi, he delivered a slave demoniac. He had his clothes ripped. He was beaten with rods. He was imprisoned and set free by an earthquake. Can you believe that? And then led his jailer and the jailer's entire family to the Lord. He created a citywide riot in Thessalonica in chapter 17. He debated with the Areopagus in Athens. And in fact, some of them started to follow Paul. And in Corinth, he led the ruler of the synagogue and his household to Christ. And so in all of that, Paul had one message, the word of Christ. What am I saying? When Paul offered the gospel as the answer to racial division, again, Paul wasn't being simplistic. This was a harvest-proven, persecution-proof, battle-tested, blood, sweat, and tears-proven message. Through all of his experience, in the harvest that he saw, the opposition, the persecution, the jailing, the leading of families to Christ, Paul understood that only one message had the power to redeem an individual, but not just an individual, his family, a city, a region, and the nations. But the question is how? How does the gospel unite nations and races together? That's what we'll talk about uh, this morning or afternoon. First, the gospel unites nations by bringing everyone under unity in Christ. See, in Romans 10, we just read that, verses 12 and 13, Paul said, There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, we didn't read verse 11 anymore, but if you pull verse 11 in, twice Paul says everyone, twice Paul says all, and once he says Jew and Greek. In other words, five references to the inclusivity of the gospel message that we preach. In other words, Paul was talking about something greater than just reconciliation and peace making here. In other words, Paul properly identified the root of the problem, and it was sin. See, sin distorts our sense of identity so that we draw our identity from things other than God, like our race, our nation, our culture, or our politics. And outside of Christ, these differences divide. These differences create a wall of division, and division is always dishonorable to God. Now, Paul understood as well that this racial divide between the Jews and the Gentiles. This was not unique to Rome. In fact, it goes way, way, way back centuries. And we all know this from reading the Old Testament that the Jews had laws and customs that separated them from the Gentiles. I mean, to them, Gentiles were outsiders. They were unclean. They were pagan. They were wicked. They were idolaters. In contrast, Gentiles looked at Jews as superstitious, primitive, strange, uh, legalistic, and, you know, well, what's this circumcision thing? And this animosity and strife got compounded over hundreds and thousands of years. And Paul himself was a Pharisee of Pharisees, so he, he was fully immersed in this type of discrimination. But then Paul met Christ on his way to Damascus. And that conversion experience so formed Paul that it changed the way he saw the world and the way he related with everyone. And he understood all men are the same. In that, we have the same problem, sin. And therefore, there was one answer for all men, Jew or Gentile or whatever your race may be. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because again, the gospel has the power to transform individuals, families, communities, and nations. If sin distorts our true identity, the gospel restores our true identity in Christ. Therefore, Paul made the race issue a gospel issue. And so if you read through Romans, what did Paul do? He brought all of his readers and hearers back to the 
entire gospel story all the way to the beginning. He talked about creation. He talked about the fall. He talked about the choosing of Israel. He talked about the failure of Israel. He talked about the birth, life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now how God is forming a people, not of law, not by race, but a people of the promise, a people of the faith. What was he doing? He was bringing all us in to find our identity in the ultimate purpose of God, which is to bring all things in heaven and on earth, Ephesians 1.10 says, under Christ, in Christ, summed up in Christ, in unity in Christ. Again, not by law, not by race, but by faith. In other words, in Christ, we are all the same. We are sons and daughters of God. See, when we submit to Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord, He is our highest allegiance. Our loyalty belongs to Him above all else. Above family, above race, above nation, above politics, above culture, above everything else. Our primary identity is our faith. I am a Christian first before I am anything else. I am a Christian first before I'm a Filipino. I'm a Christian first before I'm a Paderes. We're Christians first before we are Bisaya or Ilongo. We're Christians first before we are a UP Maroon or a UST Growling Tiger. We're Christians first before I'm from uh, Dasmarinas Gillage or, or I'm an Alabanger. You know, our highest identity, our true identity is in Christ. And all who believe in Christ are one in Him, in one family, the household of God. And so when we find and root our identity in Christ, differences no longer divide. In fact, it becomes a diversity that we celebrate. In Christ, we find unity in diversity. And heaven is like that. You know, we have, um, let me show you a picture of our staff in Nepal. And one of the greatest forms of social discrimination today is the Hindu caste system. Now, it's actually already illegal uh, in Nepal, but it's so deeply ingrained among the Nepalese that daily life still operates according to the caste system. And what it is, is you are born, your family is born into a certain caste. And there's nothing you can do to change it. It dictates your entire life from birth till death. And you cannot break out of it. You cannot escape it. You are stuck there for the rest of your life. And your caste dictates who your friends are, which schools you can go to, who you can marry, what kind of job you can get. And so it's a very oppressive social type of discrimination. But what I am proudest of to say, and this is Pastor Richard and Rita Devera, our missionaries to Nepal, is that our Every Nation Nepal staff represent every level of caste in Nepal. You will not find this anywhere else in Nepal. People don't work together from different castes. They don't even eat together if they're from different castes. But in Every Nation Nepal, not only do they work together, they are brothers and sisters in Christ. In fact, um, Rabin, who's our senior pastor, is from the highest caste, the Brahmin, where they get the Hindu priests. And Rupesh, who's our other pastor, is from the lowest caste, the Dalits. And yet, in Christ, they are brothers. And so, the caste system lost its power to divide through the gospel. And they now all see each other the way they truly are, made in the image of God. That's why Paul says in Galatians 3, 26 to 29, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Through the gospel, through the preaching of the gospel, God is building a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilinguistic church from every tongue, 
tribe, and nation. The second way the gospel changes the world is that it transforms nations through discipleship. Verses 14 and 15 from our passage again, Paul asks, How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? You know, Paul loved to ask questions. I think there's about 85 questions in the entire book of Romans. And in these two verses alone, he posed four questions, each of them a how question. And basically what Paul was saying was, if we truly believe that the gospel has the power to change lives and nations, how is that going to happen? What happens now? How will the nations hear this transforming message? And Paul's answer was very clear. A clear presentation of the gospel always precedes faith. So Paul's logic went like this. Unity and transformation in the nations can only happen when nations cry out to God. And so for nations to call on the name of the Lord, well, nations must first believe in Christ. For nations to believe in Christ, well, they must first hear the gospel. Well, to hear the gospel, believers must first preach the gospel to the nations. And for believers to preach the gospel, churches must first send missionaries. Okay, let me reverse the order so it's more understandable and chronological. In other words, when churches send missionaries, believers will preach the gospel. Then nations will hear the gospel. So nations will believe in Christ and therefore nations will call on the name of the Lord. Now, let me tweak it one other way by framing it in the negative. If churches don't send missionaries, then believers won't preach the gospel. Then nations won't hear the gospel. Nations, therefore, won't believe in Christ. Nations won't call on the name of the Lord. And therefore, unity and transformation in the nations will be impossible. In other words, at stake, when we fail to obey, the commission and the command to take the gospel to the nations are the mission and the honor of God. Now, God is committed to his mission. He will work outside the church if he has to. But he has chosen to fulfill his plans and purposes through the church. And the starting point is the preaching of the gospel and the taking of the gospel to the nations. In other words, the church is formed through the preaching of the word of Christ. You know, when Pastor Carlo and Sandra Ratilia moved to Myanmar in the year 2002, um, a few years prior to that, Newsweek came out with a cover story uh, naming Myanmar as the worst place in the world to be a student. Because at the time, the ruling military junta had closed all the universities and colleges, you know, for fear of student activism. And so, Every young Burmese at the time, their dream was education. That was the highest felt need. And so Pastor Carlo and Sandra studied the situation and they came up with one of the most innovative programs to engage locals, which they called E++, English with a difference. And so churches were banned. You know, Christianity was illegal at the time. And so what Pastor Carlo and Sandra did was, um, well, it wasn't a church. Okay, what they did was they brought students into a room and they helped them learn English through music or in our words, praise and worship. So young Burmese students learned English by singing songs of worship to God. Okay, after worship, it was now time to develop your listening skills. So Pastor Carlo would preach the word. And so uh, the, the Burmese students started developing their listening skills by listening to the word of God. After the preaching, they would divide into small groups uh, to practice their English by answering discussion questions based on the preaching of Pastor Carlo. You know, one of the guys who uh, first came uh, to the, one of those earlier E++ meetings was a guy named Matthew. Very tall, skinny, shy kid, but very brilliant, became quickly one of the top English students um, and in that process was discipled for two to three years and eventually surrendered his life to Christ. It took about two to three years. I mean, 
Burmese are Buddhist in background. A few have heard of Jesus Christ or the gospel. So Pastor Carlo discipled Matthew uh, for a process of about two to three years, after which Matthew eventually surrendered to Christ. And in one of their discipleship moments, Pastor Carlo asked Matthew, what is your dream? Okay, what do you feel God's called you to do? And Matthew's response was, I want to be in government. Now, if you're not familiar with Myanmar politics and history, at that time, that was a laughable answer. It was an impossible dream. But Pastor Carlo, being the man of God that he is, spoke faith, spoke vision, and spoke destiny to Matthew. Now, not long after that, Sandra was invited by an international organization in Yangon to speak. And because Matthew was one of the top English students, he, she brought Matthew along as her translator. And after that seminar, the organization that invited Sandra noticed Matthew, where'd you get this kid? How, how does he know English so well? And so soon after they hired uh, Matthew, this international organization, and that opened the door for Matthew into the world of you know, social development. And eventually, fast forward several years later, Matthew earned a scholarship in UK to study. And then he was invited by the World Bank and IMF to speak in Washington, DC. He started his own NGO. And even now, the government asks his help to write environmental laws. Now, I said all that to say this. This November, there's a very important election happening. I'm not referring to the U.S. presidential elections. This is more important as far as I'm concerned, at least. Matthew is running for district administrator in Myanmar. Okay, now, we don't have a, the equivalent of a district administrator. They have a different form of government. But in our terms, he is like the mayor of three cities. Not just one city. He, he will oversee, if he wins, he will oversee three cities. Now, Matthew will be the first to say that everything he learned about Christianity, about the gospel, about leadership, even English, he learned in church. So let's pray this November, more than anything, let's pray for Matthew to win as district administrator. But let me ask you this, what kind of man would Matthew be today had he not heard the gospel some 20 years ago? or not been discipled by Pastor Carlo through the Word of God? Here's another question. What kind of nation would Myanmar be, become in 10 years or 20 years as Matthew and others like him begin to fulfill the call of God in their lives to become national leaders? Again, the gospel has the power to unite and transform nations, peoples, and cultures. That's why Every Nation Philippines and Victory is so committed to send preachers and missionaries of the gospel out into the nations of the world. To date, we have 176 Filipino long-term cross-cultural missionaries in 45 nations around the world. In Asia alone, which is our primary mission field, we have 106 missionaries in 20 nations. Most of these nations, here's a list, let me show you a list, are restricted nations. And the reason there's only 20 is because our, our missionaries don't stay forever. The job is to engage, disciple, and train local leaders and turn the churches over to them, just like they did in Nepal and just like they did in Myanmar. Those churches are now fully led by local Nepalese and local Burmese. Now, our missionaries are regular people. They weren't born missionaries. They're like you and I. They had jobs, they have families, but they heard the call of God to take the gospel to the nations, to bring transformation to nations and peoples and cultures. And they left those jobs and have dedicated their lives to helping God fulfill His mission. Now next week, we're going to announce a very exciting brand new church plant not just in a new nation, but in, in an entire new region. So Pastor Rico Ford, I'll save the news for next week, but don't miss next week's service. Pastor Rico Rico Ford will share the vision for a brand new, exciting church plan. But as Victory members, our part to play in helping bring unity and transformation to the ends of the earth is by praying for nations.
is by giving to the nations. And we'll give you an opportunity in a few minutes. And finally, by going to the nations. We have what we call our 10 days program. In closing, let me take you to Revelation 7, 9, where John has given us a picture of heaven. And John wrote, After this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. You know, heaven is a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilinguistic place. And guess what we do with our diversity in heaven? We worship and we honor God with the, our linguistic differences, our cultural distinctions, and our racial uniqueness. And again, we help make this a reality or become fulfilled by taking the gospel to the nations so that we become part of God's ultimate plan to bring all things under Christ and in Christ. Let me just pray for all of us today. Lord, we thank you that the gospel has the power to save. Lord, not just individuals, but nations, families, cities, and regions. And Lord, we thank you that even as a believer, I have a part to play in helping fulfill your ultimate purpose of bringing all things under Christ in heaven and on earth. And that is by praying, by giving, and by going. Lord, I pray for each and every person here today that even as they obey your call to help bring the gospel to the nations, that your blessing, your protection, and your faithfulness would be upon them and their families. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.